Hello, everyone, and welcome to this conversation in celebration of United Nations World Ocean Day. This day is a reminder of the collaborative action necessary to protect and restore biodiversity on our blue planet. We can think of no better way to honor this momentous day and the outset of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development than by bringing together in conversation two incredible organizations, Greenwave and the Outlaw Ocean Project. In their unique ways, each of these institutions influence and educate upon ocean affairs at a micro and macro scale, spotlighting inequities and providing more sustainable models for our relationship with the ocean. We had the opportunity to meet both of the founders of these organizations in our recent filming of the documentary In Good Taste. We are so thrilled that they were both able to sit down with us today to discuss the issues at hand. Ian Urbina is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, author, and founder of the Outlaw Ocean Project. Bren Smith is the executive director and co-founder of Greenwave. Without further ado, I will allow you to dive into the conversation between these two experts and hope that you will enjoy. My name is Ian Urbina. I'm the director of the Outlaw Ocean Project, which is a journalism organization in Washington, DC, and it uh, focuses on human rights, labor, and environmental concerns offshore around the world. My name is Bren Smith. I'm the executive director of Greenwave and the owner of Thimble Island Ocean Farm. And Greenwave is a nonprofit, and we're training the next generation of regenerative ocean farmers. My interest in the ocean began about five years ago, journalistically, and I was, uh, and still am, primarily looking at um, doing a couple of things. One is highlighting to the landlubber global public, you know, kind of what happens out there, quite especially problematic things that happen out there. And at the intersection of uh, environmental and human stories, um, aquaculture specifically uh, grabbed my interest um, because of a component within some types of aquaculture, not all. Um, this is a, uh, uh, the, the component is fish meal, and, and that refers to typically um, wild caught fish, you know, fish caught at sea that gets in, in unsustainably large amounts that then gets ground up into the, this powder, this high protein powder or pellets. And that um, thing called fish meal is used to feed uh, livestock, chicken, pigs, um, but also farmed fish, aquaculture fish, uh, some types of them. And um, that's a real worry uh, because of the unsustainable nature of it. And specifically because um, uh, the, one of the very things that aquaculture hoped to slow down, i.e. ocean depletion, how quickly the seas are running out of fish, um, because of fish meal is um, some types of aquaculture, that which depends on fish meal, is actually now um, accelerating ocean depletion. So that's why I was very interested in um, looking at that concern. Um, so, you know, I, I dropped out of high school when I was 14 and became a commercial fisherman. I grew up in Newfoundland, Canada, sort of the ultimate artisanal, um, uh, uh, you know, selling cod tongues door to door, fishermen's co-op, little brightly colored houses, you know, on the edge of uh, edge of North America. And I went to fish the globe and I ended up in um, Alaska. I was in Gloucester for a while, but I ended up in Alaska uh, fishing gray and black cod and crab. And the trouble, I mean, you know, I just loved that job, right? You know, the uh, uh, 30 foot waves, belly of a boat with 13 other people for months at a time. And just this incredible pride of feeding my country, right? There are certain jobs in our economy that come with deep, deep culture, I'd say, uh, jobs that power the country, like coal workers, uh, that build the country, like steel workers, that feed the country, like, like farmers and fishermen. And the trouble was, we got too good at what we did, right? We became pillagers. That's, this is one of the downfalls of humans. We, we keep improving. And um, the cod stocks crashed while I was um, in Alaska and um, in Newfoundland, where I was from. And that was a huge wake up call. 30,000 people thrown out of work overnight. 
uh, canneries, empties, boat, uh, boats beached, and just sort of like hungry ghosts walking, uh, walking the streets looking for a sense of meaning. And just to see a culture built, an economy built up over hundreds of years, destroyed overnight through um, uh, destructive fishing uh, practices was, um, uh, was a real wake up call that there aren't gonna be any jobs on a dead ocean, right? And this was the moment that I realized this, there had to be a collaborative relationship between me as a harvester and the ocean as a, as a resource. So I went on this journey of, I didn't know what it was, but a journey of figuring out how to farm the ocean. I ended up in the aquaculture farms uh, in Northern Canada, which was absolutely uh, terrible. It was pig farms at sea, essentially, um, growing, um, uh, we were doing salmon. It was neither fish nor food, antibiotics, everything Ian was talking about, um, lots of wild fish feed. And so I kept searching and just refusing to leave the ocean and asking this question, like, how do I keep the soul of a fisherman but die on my boat one day uh, doing something uh, sustainable? And, you know, what the soul of a fisherman is, is you have a self-directed life, you succeed and fail on your own terms, um, no boss, and you have the pride of feeding your country, these jobs that you sing songs about. So that's where, that's where, uh, that was that uh, search that I've been on ever since. That was poetic. Um, I it made me wish I was recording. Um, uh, I'm serious, I, the lines in there that, um, uh, let me just change. Uh, um, that I'd like to steal. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so next question. So for 17 years, I was on staff as an investigative reporter at the New York Times. And, the and my job was to come up with project ideas that would usually last a year or so. They're investigative, so this is prosecutorial journalism. It's it's journalism with a mission to expose things that are problematic, wrong, um, in an aggressive but balanced, fair way. Um, I had before being coming a journalist worked as a cultural anthropologist, and um, in that capacity, spent some time on ships and become enamored um, for reasons in hearing Bren talk. I think anyone can relate to, but I had become enamored with what I viewed as this diaspora and transient tribe of people that were so essential to our world, but from whom you really heard and about whom you really read stories. And so I was drawn first to seafarers and mariners and fishers, and second to that the, the big blue, you know, um, the two thirds of the planet that's water. Um, but journalistically, uh, what I was captivated by was uh, the diversity, part of the thing was the diversity of concerns out there that intersect the, um, with the, the people, the 56 million people that work offshore and, and um, the stories that could be told about what's going on out there. So, uh, Wrote a, wrote a series of pieces for the New York Times over the course of two years and then wrote a book. And then when I came back, I decided I wanted to stick with this uh, diaspora tribe and this place and this line of reporting. And so I stepped away from the New York Times and created a journalism nonprofit. And um, uh, its goal is to produce these stories and to place them in uh, first as long written narrative kind of um, pieces, but then and place them in tier one outlets, you know, The New Yorker, Washington Post, Der Spiegel, BBC, The Economist, these sorts of places, and then uh, then also translate them into foreign languages and then run them elsewhere in the world so that um, some of the very coastal communities, especially in the global south, that are most impacted by these concerns would also perhaps benefit from take an interest in the stories and then further convert the journalism even more into other types of things, music, podcast, doc series, animation series, games, you know, other ways to reach people in, to reach different people in different ways. Um, so that's what the Outlaw Ocean Project does. It's a nonprofit that does the stories, but also converts them and distributes them in hopefully innovative and more effective ways. And I really want that. I want a sea shanty about 
regenerative ocean farming. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. We're, we're trying yeah. to train the uh, urchins to 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 uh, chant. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, on my search for uh, a, a new relationship to the ocean, developed a form of farming um, which we call regenerative ocean farming, and it it's not like I invented anything. I'm part of a really 3000 year history of trying to grow food in the oceans. The, the first shellfish farmer, farmers in, in, uh, in the world were actually indigenous communities in the Pacific North, Northwest doing clam walls. Um, uh, and so I'm this, I'm this moment. And um, what, what, what I, I think my perspective on aquaculture is that it really went wrong in the eighties. What it did was um, it decided to grow around existing markets, right? So people like to eat salmon and tuna, so it tried to grow salmon and tuna. Um, but that's a wild palate, right? And they, no one ever asked the ocean, what does it make sense to grow? And you, when you ask that from the ocean, you ask what's unique about it as an agricultural space, it says to you, why don't you grow things that don't swim away and you don't have to feed? And suddenly that opens up a whole world of low infrastructure because you don't need nets and pens, zero inputs. You don't need water, fresh water. You don't need fertilizer. You don't need feeds. Um, uh, 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 and you can do more. You can go beyond sustainability of just having not just having a, a low footprint, but actually breathing life back into the ocean. So I grow a mix of shellfish and seaweeds, a polyculture uh, model. And each of our crops plays a role of regeneration. So oysters filter um, 50 gallons of water a day, pulling nitrogen out of the water column. Kelp soaks up five times more carbon than land-based plants. It's the sequoia of the sea. And so the, the, the like opening this box of what ocean farming could be with 10,000 plants in the ocean, hundreds of kinds of shellfish, there's just this journey of a climate Act, uh, like climate farming leading to climate cuisine, which I think moves us into a hopeful space, a solutions based um, uh, space, and could create, you know, tens of thousands of jobs for folks like me that have been pushed off, um, uh, pushed off the ocean because of, um, you know, industrial fishing. So the nonprofit uh, Green Wave, its role, and we work nationally. Um, it is to train that next generation. Our goal is to train 10,000 new fa uh, farmers and hatchery workers in the next 10 years. Um, and we target fishermen directly affected by climate change and indigenous uh, communities. Uh, we just started the first indigenous owned seaweed hatchery in the country up in Alaska with um, uh, Dune, Dune Lankard. And um, uh, uh, you know, we really hope to get to a point where we have what we think of as green wave reefs, where you have 25 to 50 small scale farms in an area producing about 2 million pounds of kelp as one of the crops, a seafood hub, a hatchery, and then a ring of entrepreneurs creating value added uh, products. And then you replicate those reefs up and down the coast. And that's what scale looks like. It's not massive industrial thousand acre banana plantations. It's network production, which allows collaboration, innovation, and um, a, a community benefit rather than vertical benefit where just a few people are, are reaping all the profits at the uh, uh, at the top. So Greenway's role is to, is to replicate this. And we've trained um, uh, about 300 people so far. And um, uh, we're just in the middle of scaling up with a, with a mix of um, uh, an online platform and, and uh, you know, all, uh, sort of distributed training system. Ian, one of the things that I, I mean, what I love about the ocean in my life was that there is zero oversight. <laughs> you know, like there's a thrill to, to being uh, left alone uh, uh, to do good and bad things, right? And um, uh, in many ways, it's why I missed that job so much. It was just like, it was all about those of us out in the frontiers sort of making our own rules. And it wasn't all destructive. Like we were trying to do the right thing a bunch. And we just seem to be entering, I, I'm calling the wind, wind farm stories pretty closely. And you know some of the new Biden administration work about uh, allowing wind, wind farms on the up and down the coast here, which I actually really support. 
And we're excited to actually build our farms inside the wind farms, mm. right? very possible to do that, create these industrial space. Why just harvest wind when we could do uh, uh, food and, and other crops in there? But like, do you see this future? Like, it, it, are you seeing a speed up of rules moving out to sea? You mean like, like a, a, we're entering a regulatory moment with aquaculture and with wind farms and it actually having an effect on the culture or is it just too early like i'll just say this last thing like we we train all these farmers and a lot of them love to follow the rules these new they're not farmers like you know they're from all walks of life and i don't know <laughs> i don't get along with them as well you know <laughs> they're a different species um no i mean truth is um you have your finger on the pulse of of the actual industry of fishers way more than I do. Um, uh, so I don't have an answer for you, you on the feeling within the tribe, you know, like um, my observation of things imposed on the tribe, if you will, um, is that uh, no, I don't see much to my dismay, um, while being very respectful and very acutely aware of the the beauty of the sort of um, freedom that the sea represents and offers. Um, uh, but I don't see, unfortunately, the kind of regulatory action coming either from the government or the marketplace. I really feel like corporate players, but I'm also, you know, are, are really where it's at in terms of if this if the things that i work on are going to be solved mm -hmm. sea slavery and these sorts of things it's probably not going to be by some piece of legislation out of the eu or us it's going to be by some big player like walmart or cp foods or whatever saying we're going to do things differently and then the market shifts and people embrace new norms but also bear in mind like i'm i'm looking at such a different part of your tribe you know i'm looking at the developing world i'm looking at transshipment industrial commercial vessels and etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm so out of um fluency with your demographic you know yeah. folk, guys that are and women who are working in fairly well managed even for all the cod problems etc you know uh, they, they don't compare to the east sea or the south china sea or you know so yeah. all that is to say but i don't see much movement from from players on the things that would actually address murder of stowaways and, and illegal dumping and sea slavery and arms trafficking, these big problems out there, yeah. I don't see a huge amount of movement. Because one of the, I mean, I, like one of, one of the reasons we're excited about the regenerative ocean farming sector is it allows us to, to write the rules, right? We can build an economy and a regulatory environment from the bottom up. So we can take all those things that we shouldn't done in aquaculture, industrial uh, fishing, in land-based ag, mm -hmm. and just replicate them out in the sea. And that means labor laws that I just went through a permitting process, 10 month permitting process to do um, uh, a different kind of, um, uh, I just increased yields by a multiple of five on the farm through a new farm design. Mm -hmm. And 10 months I thought was really reasonable to implement it. Like everybody else complains about that, but it was a really good thing. And we we worked with this, the, the officials on um, uh, sort of marine entanglement and all these issues and how to design. And um, it seems to me more of these types of farms, I'm not trying to just advocate just for this type of farming, but more people doing solutions-based approach in the ocean uh, opens up an, a political moment mm -hmm. to regulate and, and then move like further and further out, out to sea. And then, also on this, it allows like the Maori were just granted, I think it was 15,000 hectares of ocean property for ocean farming as part of a reparations program, right? From the, from the New Zealand government. Um, and it, it is, it's just this space where I just wonder over time if we can, we can build so, you know, sort of build a, a set of rules that both keep the tribe culturally thick but also, you know, um, uh, 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 protects the commons yeah. and the other things we need. No, I mean, I, I do think, Bren, you are fairly unusual, both in your, the rigor and nuance um, of your broad outlook at trying to change the design of how the industry works and what new sub-industries can emerge, but also just in your very 
um, mission to not just produce something, but to produce something in a way that is more sustainable. I think my impression is that uh, most industries and yours in particular are mostly populated by folks that are not bad people, but are rather people that are just trying to get by and get the job done. And that's hard enough to do um, in this day and age. And they're not spending a whole lot of time thinking about meta structure and design and, and how to build better. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I, I expect I'm gonna fail, <laughs> but, but, but it's a decent way to spend the day. You know? it's, it's, uh, <laughs> enjoy, enjoy the process while. <laughs> I mean, we're all going to burn and drown, right? I mean, let's get into that headspace. Why not all. enjoy the final hours? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll start, and then you can actually bring in real knowledge. I'll I'll start with bullshit, and you bring in fact. Like, um, I mean, uh, um, I'm new uh, to the topic of aquaculture, so I have a very basic level understanding in preparation for this one story that we produced for the New Yorker magazine. It was a, it was a look at, um, again, the aquaculture and its history in general and what its loftiest uh, ambitions were at the outset. My impression is that among those ambitions, one thing that attracted people was the notion that, um, by embracing this thing, fish farming, by building, by by essentially growing your own sea product, um, uh, 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 whether it's in nearshore pens or on land earthen pools or what whatever form, you could lessen the pressure uh, um, and the speed at which with which we were taking fish out of the sea, and um, that was promising. Uh, and you could also potentially control the environment better, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, one of the moments when everything went awry, it was when the sort of profit margin, profit incentive, and scaling up of that be, kind of became runaway, and it became big business. And the desire was to go bigger and farm faster and, and, you know, kind of cut corners in the process. And when you scale up too big, just like with, uh, you know, um, the, the history of, um, you know, you know, cattle farming, when we started penning animals, chickens, pigs, cows, the same basic problems began to emerge when we scaled up, you know, too big, you know, how do you deal with so much waste? How do you deal with the disease that come when they're all penned in together? How do you deal with the cruelty concerns that come with, you know, the industrial process of how they're treated? Um, how do you, you know, get these things, these creatures to grow faster and fatter so you can make more money sooner on them? This is, these are the sorts of things that emerge, the emissions from the waste. How do you deal with that stuff? Um, thus, you start getting antibiotics, you start getting, you know, runoff, you start getting all these things that you can look over at cattle and then they're kind of the same problem that you start seeing in, in aquaculture. So, um, but, and I honed in on one of those many concerns, which was how do you feed these guys? You know, how do you like fatten them up fast and how has the industry chosen to do that? And that's where I got really interested in, wait, they're taking fish out of the sea, grinding them up and feeding them to these other fish on land. That seems kind of counterproductive, but um, that's indeed, you know, one chapter of that story and, and what attracted my interest. But the thing that's really important why Bren is the key person to actually listen to is that the truth is there's lots of different types of aquaculture, right? And it's not all towards carnivorous um, raising of, of fish that are for this elite bloated market of what humans supposedly want. You, you can affect what humans want. And furthermore, there's a whole section of aquaculture where you're raising things, living things that are more sustainable, healthier for the humans, don't require all these inputs, don't have all these other concerns. And if you just adjust things a little bit in that direction and, and look at that part of aquaculture, you have a very different prognosis, future, and, and origin story. Yeah. That, that, that New Yorker piece you wrote was just excellent, Ian. It was, just, it was, it was fascinating. And I like 
you know, I gave it a close read. <laughs> you can imagine. It was like, you know, you're writing about my family or something. But it was just really, really well done. I mean, um, and I mean, aquaculture, it's not just that it grows fish, but it's obsessed with monoculture. And we know Mother Nature abhors monoculture and she attacks it, right? And that's why she, she attacks um, uh, monoculture and there you, then you have to fight back with uh, antibiotics and pesticides and things like that. When you grow with diversity in mind, with biodiversity in mind, um, you, you know, you're working with, not against, um, is sort of the dynamics, the fundamental design principles uh, uh, of the ocean. Um, you know, the, I, 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 I'm not a statistics, statistics guy, but I think like half of China's wild fish catch now goes to uh, farm, to feed farm fish. That's insane. And they've got a new fish farm, offshore fish farming ship they're, they're, they're designing, which it costs a billion dollars, right? And that says to me, complexity, <laughs> expensive, which means that regular people can't access this. So it's going to be, you know, so it access this. So it's, it's, a, it, it's structured to be capital intensive and, 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 and corporate, um, corporate, corporate owned. So, um, you know, aquaculture is the worst brand name in the grocery store. And there's a reason for that. It has a history as part of that history. Um, and you'll never see me say the word aquaculture when I talk about my work. We're just ocean farmers. We're just like Hudson Valley uh, farmers growing a mix of, mix of uh, crops on, on land. And that's our family. Now, I mean, I've got a lot of friends that grow fish and many of them are on this journey of sustainability. They're trying to make it better, lower wild fish feeds, things like that. The trouble is, is, you know, they're still in sort of an environmental um, uh, test phase. I think they went to market too fast. Like if they'd figured out algae-based feeds and, and, and uh, uh, the right um, spacing of pens and things like that. It might make sense, but um, uh, being an environmental beta phase and rushing to market just really, uh, I don't think makes, uh, makes sense at all. And you know, the last thing I'd say is we often get asked to build our seaweed and shellfish farms around fish farms because we can clean up the waste, right? And, and I don't do that because our job is not to make a bad thing better or a problematic thing better. Our job is not to be sustainable. Our job is to be regenerative. So we're like, no, our job is to breathe life back into the ocean, rather minimize the, the, the impacts of things that are, that are problematic. So um, I don't want to over-criticize my dear friends in the aquaculture industry, but like, it just, I don't know, it's just so simple to me. They swim away. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, again, um, high altitude here. Um, a lot of what I work on, again, is 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 in the global south and developing nation contexts um, on industrial commercial uh, boats, um, and it's so it's a different. Uh, geographic space than where Bren is. Uh, th these are um, far less regulated waters, etc. Um, and on these boats, uh, in this space, um, the things that I'm working on tend to be um, a, a, the myriad concerns, you know, from murder to slavery to rape to intentional dumping of oil and other waste at sea to arms trafficking to illegal whaling to over you know illegal and overfishing murder of stowaways you know it's 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 so um i'm largely looking at these issues um and the categories of concerns and crimes that are outside of the specific sustainability meta crime you know which is a real concern um uh, i do think when you look at that taxonomy of worries, um, you see a couple of conceptual common denominators. And one of them is um, this notion of hidden costs. You know, like um, all of these players that are typically producing things, they're extracting oil and gas, or they're looking for the next cure for cancer and on the seafloor, or they're um, fishing for this, that, or the other, and they're moving cargo iPhones and Nikes from A to B, whatever they're doing 
they tend to be doing things in the context of, you know, this globalized capital, you know, moment that we live in, where um, the market is decentralized and the way stuff is made is horizontal, not vertical, you know, and it's shifting. And all of that is towards the simple point of faster and cheaper, right? So that the, the buyers of whatever that thing is can get it faster and cheaper. And we are at a moment now where we get things impossibly fast and impossibly cheap, truly. And I mean that word impossibly because they are illusions, you know, that um, the illusion is that the price tag is a lie. That's not actually how much it costs. The, 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 the truth of that cost is the hidden variables that were in the supply chain. The, the, the illegal fishing that was involved, the use of nets that shouldn't have been involved, the use of uh, debt bonded or trafficked or forced labor that was involved, um, the disappearance of people that was involved, the dumping of stuff that cost too much to properly dispose of was involved. These are all hidden costs. The, the dumping of carbon into the air in the supposedly bottomless trash can that is our skies, which we now know is in a bottomless trash can and we call it climate crisis and climate change. These are all invisible costs. So I think like conceptually, I sort of funnel all the way down to Bren with this notion of hidden costs and the need, you know, sort of the urgent call for like the world to reckon with the fact that unless we're honest about the amount of hidden costs that are going into the $1.99 can of skipjack tuna, like um, that got here possibly in seven days, um, uh, unless we're, we really are start, start to be honest about the price of things, then we're not going to then be able to embrace the true um, value of things that are, that are produced in the right way. Yeah, that's, um, uh... Um, that's amazing. And I think I, my worry is in my world is, 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 you know, I, I used to say like, how much evil can you do with kelp? Like, so what if, if big companies are growing kelp, right? It's great. Well, you know, there are now 40,000, there's a 40,000 hectare um, a monoculture kelp farm land off the coast of Africa. Um, uh, from, and it, it was some folks out of the oil industry are, are, are doing this sort of model of natural solutions, natural capitalism. Um, but suddenly we have mass monoculture farm in a place, they didn't do it around here because of the regulatory environment. They did it there because it was easy. Um, you know, they're, they're still in the process of, of building it. But I really see two parallel tracks, like we're gonna do ours, we have 6,000 people on our waiting list just in the US for training to be ocean farmers, right? Um, and request in 110 countries. And we have this model that we're moving forward. But the other one, this the sort of banana plantations out at sea with regenerative crops is going to happen as well. And I think there's a moment where society needs to choose which one they want to choose. And ours is more expensive, it's less efficient. And we're proud to be inefficient, right? <laughs> like that's one of our, our, our badges. And it's more interesting to be inefficient, right? You know, you have to be more creative. And because we certainly don't get um, rewarded, the market doesn't reward us for the, for, for, for the, for the, the, uh, uh, for the good things we do. I don't, I'm not rewarded for the carbon I pull out of the water, for the nitrogen I pull out of the water. I'm not rewarded for, for feeding people locally. Right, that should be a premium, not not by um, uh, customers having to pay for it, but through other uh, you know other mechanisms that represent all the good that um, that we, that we try to do. So I see a fight coming in the future in my sector of what's the model of our industry going to be, and is it going to be more than just a climate solution? Is it going to meld climate and justice together? And, and I, I really believe we have to keep justice, you know, justice, inequality, and climate solutions linked because if our climate solutions don't reimagine the economy, I mean, let the whole thing burn. I don't want to live in a world with this level of pain, suffering, injustice, racial strife, and things like that. I, you know, I, I, I want to live somewhere that's new, refreshing, beautiful, and hopeful. And the climate moment is our moment to do that. Um, so 
So that, that's sort of where we're embarked. But I'm, I'm definitely the lazy approach of taking the 20th century models and putting them on, on, on these newest solutions is, is, is a real danger. You know, we have this challenge at GreenWave where um, uh, we have too many people to train. We, we started out just training 10 farmers a year here, here in New England. Right, it was um, uh, a small, and you know, it was good. We learned how to train people, but then there was a tsunami of interest, and we have, again, like I said, in North America, I mean, just in in the U.S., six thousand people on our on our waiting list, and so we've developed a program. One which is high touch, one is low touch, and the high touch program really targets the folks that are being affected by climate change and those that were structurally excluded by the last, um, you know, by the industrial revolution. So fishermen directly affected by climate change, and then indigenous communities. Um, and uh, 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 we, we now have it, we, we've got indigenous programming here in, in, in uh, New York, uh, in British Columbia, in, um, in Alaska, and some and a small program in, in, in New Zealand. And the idea is really how do we weave social justice into the DNA of this, this economy and make sure that the folks that need it most are in the front of the line. Who farms matters? Like it's not just that we're farming, but we need we need structures that really open up opportunity for folks that have been excluded. Um, so we've got an internship program in our hatcheries for inner city kids, um, uh, 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 which has been just been amazing to watch folks come in, folks that don't want to be on boats. There are hatchery jobs they can take. There are processing jobs they can start value added added uh, companies. Um, so that's the that's sort of who farm matters. The other piece of this to to scale, we've got an online platform with a toolkit, a farm design planner where people can put um, you know the, their depths, their bottom types, things like that, and it will spit out out of two different farm designs a budget, a gear list, um, uh, and then we have a whole curriculum from from seed to harvest. We've got a data dashboard where farmers can remotely track what's happening on their farm both through weather stations and nutrient um, uh, 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 fluctuations uh, on the farm and then a digital uh, co-op are all, all sort of our offerings here. And this allows us to scale. This allows us not to be training high touch uh, with everybody and allow people to start their own farms, but give them tools to be successful. I, my product is information and stories. And so when I think about consumers, um, I'm, it's, it's important to remember that I'm talking about people like Bren, but I don't make anything. <laughs> I, make, I make stories and I try to expose things and I try to explain them and I try to get um, out to, to the people who I want to learn some. Um, now, I do think there's real innovation in my um, profession that needs to occur, not just in how are we gonna fund um, this expensive kind of journalism, but also how do we get at um, the not already converted and who are they and where are they and what are means of getting to them? And so in that realm, you know, if I want to do a piece of, about Bren, that's great. And you got to figure out how to do it so that it's narrative and interesting and visual and, you know, all that. But then once you have it, thinking about, okay, how do I get my 17 year old son to actually read it? Not just some, you know, 40 year old dude in New York who's already prone to reading the New Yorker, but like, how do I get, um, you know, a 20 year old in Taiwan or Caracas or, or you know, uh, Reykjavik, you know, to, to read this story. Um, that's where the distribution of journalism is and then paying for this journalism. Th those are the big challenges that my profession faces. Um, now on the specific more narrowed topic of uh, what do we do about the oceans and how do we, um, how do we pressure consumers to reimagine the oceans um, so that they, they demand better options? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the ways to do that is to uh, begin talking with them about the you know, the, the meta structural problems of monoculture, the meta structural problems of, of, of uh, as Bren said, and, and the meta structural problems of hidden costs. And what are those hidden costs in terms of real human, you know, consequences for other people? Um, and, 
and also what are the really exciting um, solutions that they can be a part of by just opting to serve this other thing for dinner on Friday rather than, you know, what they, what they normally would order, you know? Um, so I think that's uh, where, um, where I, as a uh, purveyor of ideas uh, and information, um, where I tend to think when it comes to how to change consumers. I, I mean, I'd say Ian's stories are absolutely key because I, you know, I grow something that's disgusting. <laughs> so the key is it needs to be a really strong story. And we need your talent as a writer, right? You know, we got to go through the heart to get to the taste buds and then the stomach. So, um, uh, I mean, I, a couple things. One is, I mean, I, um, you know, we are trapped in, you know, this food economy where sort of good storied food is really, is the most expensive food, right? Um, and that's this, um, because it doesn't reflect the, um, uh, 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 the real cost of the food economy right now. Um, I will say that I have high hopes for changing tastes because of the climate economy, because any, anyone that's growing or producing zero input food, not using fresh water, not using fertilizer, not using feed, not using land, it's gonna be the most affordable food on the planet because all those costs, those input costs are gonna go up. And that's gonna push zero input food like shellfish and seaweed to the center of the plate. And I have full confidence that chefs are gonna make it delicious, beautiful climate cuisine. And they are, I mean, they really are. Um, uh, uh, but it's gonna take some time, but it has to be affordable food. Um, thing I'd say is um, uh, uh, as a consumer, Yes, you know, every time you cook and you buy with these, buy these um, uh, different crops, you're helping create uh, demand. But one of the powers of this is, is it's not just food, but we have a whole leaf strategy where part of our plant goes to uh, like ingredients. For example, you go out and buy the plant-based Akua burger, which is a seaweed mushroom burger. So that's great, right? You do that. But then also we use part of the plant to create organic sea-based fertilizers, right? So you can, you can buy locally grown seaweed fertilizers for your garden, for your lawn. That's having a huge effect. You can grow your own vegetables with fertilizer, not imported or made with fossil fuels like natural gas, but actually grown locally and creating jobs. And then last one is actually, if, if you're doing packaging, doing straws and things like that, you could buy seaweed-based packaging. Now that's good. It's going to take a little longer, but that's actually hitting the shelves and people are using it now. So uh, sort of use your full supply, the, the, the full like sort of power of the full supply chain and all the different things that you use and start thinking like, what can I source from the ocean as opposed to my normal bad, my, my normal buying habits? Because the ocean is so often forgotten. I mean, we think of it as a victim, right? Ian does incredible work on this. We think of acidification or we're scared of the ocean that you know, we're building seawalls and fleeing the coast. Well, you know, I think this is the moment to turn around, embrace the sea, see it as a space for solutions. And, you know, as a consumer, start buying as much stuff as you can, whether it's fertilizer, plastics, or some gross seaweed to, <laughs> to uh, uh, you know, to, to, to help build our little piece of the solutions economy. Thank you to everyone for tuning into this conversation this morning in celebration of United Nations World Ocean Day. We hope that you felt equally inspired as we did by this conversation um, and have been provided with ample resources con to continue your engagement in the preservation of ocean biodiversity for this coming decade and beyond. Please continue to explore the phenomenal work of these organizations through the logos below. You may find the journalism, the music, the storytelling, educational toolkits, and farming resources that you need to continue your journey. We want to thank again the Avila Ocean, Green Wave, Ian Urbina, and Bren Smith for their time and insights and continuing the incredible work that they do in support of the ocean, coastal communities, um, and the advancement of biodiversity at sea.